Welcome to our IRR section, which is the internal rate of return. So previously we've gone through quite a few uh, investment appraisal techniques. So for example, the return on investment in particular. So that means the accounting rate of return. So from a previous study, we know that the accounting rate of return, also known as the return on investment or return on capital employed, is the money they're going to spend and how much money they're going to get in each and every year. So that means the return on investment or ROI if you like is a measure of return in percentage terms for each and every year. But the question for that is if you were to put let's say $100 into the project and you can get let's say $30 in the first year, $100 in the second year, and $200 in the third year. What is the overall return by considering the investment out and the cash coming into the business? What is the overall return for that? If you were to calculate the overall return for the entire project, simply using the return on investment may not be so appropriate. So what we can do is going to use the internal rate of return is we're going to calculate the return from the project or from the project as a whole in percentage terms. That's what I mean by internally generated from this project and what would be the return and not in absolute terms, but in relative terms. That's what I mean by IR1. So, that's the internal rate of return. And you can see the calculation of the IR1 is this. You have to learn this. I'm going to show you an example in a second. But what do I mean by IR1 is this. If I were to say, right, this project will give us the IR1 worth of 5%, for example. But that 5% has not considered the costs that you finance this project, which means, okay, you spend $100 out. Where does this money come from? Okay, you say to me, Steve, this money will come from the liability, which means we borrow some money from our family members, and surely we we'll have to pay for the interest expense. That would be a cost. Or some of you will simply say, okay, Steve, this money comes from the equity finance, which means, okay, we issue some shares and that's it, pays dividends and so on. So that means that 5% has not considered the cost of capital. So that means if I were to say, right, if you were to do this project, you will get a return of 5%, but at the same time, you have to finance your initial cash outflow. Let's say you have to pay for the interest expense at 5% as well. So that means after you do this project, okay, you get 5% cash into the business, you pay 5% as the cash out from the business, you end up having nothing. Yes? Alternatively, if the cost of capital, cost of financing a business is 4%. That means you can get 5% in and pay 4% out. And as a result of it, you end up having 1% as the overall return. Yes? If that's the case, then accept this project. If you have 5% in, but you have to pay for 6%, for financing your business, and as a result of it, you end up with a loss worth of 1%. And hence, what you can do is going to simply reject the project. That's the decision criteria, as you can see. So that means if you calculate the IRR, you simply compare the IRR with the cost of capital. If the IRR is greater than the cost of capital, okay, accept the project. If not, simply reject it. So, that means, what do I mean by IRR? 
is the return from this project by not considering the cost of capital and that means the IRR is the point at which the MPV equals to zero. So that means we know what's MPV, yes, from our early calculation. So that means what will be the net cash flow of the company as we saw from these projects that we're going to do in the future years um, in absolute terms by considering the time value of money. Remember the MPV you need to include three things, the number of years into the future, the relevant cash flows, yes, so something that is not relevant such as the sunk costs, we have to exclude them and also an appropriate discount factor. Okay, so it's the point at which the MPV equals to zero, so that means the IRR is the maximum cost of capital. For the business. And that means, okay, if the IRR is 5%, so that means we're going to decide what is the cost we're going to pay for, let's say, the bank. Um, if we were to take out the bank loan, what is the maximum cost for us? Because exceeding that maximum cost certainly will end up with a loss making position. And in this case, if the IRR gives us 5%, so that means the maximum amount of interest rates that you're going to pay for the loan, for example, would be 5%, not 6%. Because exceeding 5%, you end up with a loss making position. So first of all, okay, let's apply the calculation into the practical case so we can see how we're going to calculate this in the exam before we talked about any of these discussive parts related to Iowa. So let's now first of all have a go at the question called Insider Limited. So as so you can see, required first of all, calculates the IRR for the entire project. So that means it's the return from this project overall. And inside the limit it's got the cash flows for a project over three years into the future, not related to past. Okay. It's to be 10, we predict that to be 10, 20, as well as 30 in each and every year into the future. And remember the IRR calculation from the performance perspective it's also based upon the net present value and that means we have to apply some of the discounts and bits and, and, and so on into our calculation and it said the cost of capital of a company is to be 10% so that means that 10% okay we can discount those cash flows 10, 20 and 30 which will give us certainly the um, what the MPV at 10%. But in order to calculate the IRR, all we need to do then is we're going to discount those cash flows at another discount rate. So let's see how we're going to do this then. So first of all, in order to calculate the IRR, first of all we have to pick up two discount rates and it's entirely up to you to pick up whatever you want in the exam. So for example, let's say We've got 10% in the question, and also we're going to discount that at 20%. Why not? Okay, so first of all, we're going to discount the cash flows at 10%. So that means, first of all, we applied the MPV calculation, same as before. We've got the number of years is 1, 2, 3, and it seems that in this question, we are not given any of this cash outflow at the start of the year. Absolutely fine, it's entirely up to you. Um, the number of years, okay, we've got the cash flows is to be 10, 20 and 30. And discount factor at 10%. So, in the, let me just calculate that for you. And so, so you can check out the press the value table if you like. So that means, okay. The, in the first year, we take 1 divided by 1.1 for power of 1. That will give me 0 0.909. We then divide by another 1.1. So that means 1 divided by 1.1 for power of 2. That will give me 
0.826 and then power of 3 standing for for the third year 0.751 we then simply times them together and that will give me the present value of 9.09 0.826 times 20, 16.52 and 30 times 0.751, 22.53. We simply add them up together, that will give me the MPV at 10%. So plus 16. 0.52 plus not 9.09 that will give me approximately 48 to 49 okay I'm going to pick up 49 it's entirely up to you the rounding difference if you like right so because we said we need to discount the cash flows at two discount rate okay simply sec no we're going to discount the same cash flows as before at 20%. So that 20% you can pick up, let's say 19%, 18%, or even 1%. It's entirely up to you. Okay, in the exam. So you will gain uh, the same marks if you choose different discount rates. It's entirely up to you. Okay. So applies the same process as before. So we've got the number of years. We've got the cash flow. One, two, three. 10, 20, and 30. We now apply now the discount rate at 20%. So that means, okay, in this case, we take 1 divided by 1.2 for power of 1, not 0.833. Of course, you can check those numbers directly from present value table rather than calculate this like this. It's entirely up to you. Um, we then Divide by another 1.2, not 0.694. We then divide by another 1.2, not 0.579. We then times the cash flows together. That will give me the present value. So it will be 8.33. And then 0 0.694 times, oops, 0 0.694 times 20 is about 13.88. Or in the exam, you simply say, okay, it's 14. Yes, that would be absolutely fine as well. Uh, 30 times 0 0.579. 1737. If you add them up together, plus 13.88 plus 8.33, so that will give you approximately 39. Okay, so after you calculate this, the MPV at different discount rates, the next thing that you're going to do is to apply to this formula, it's the I of R equals to a lower rate plus the net present value at the lower rate divided by the net present value at the lower rate minus the higher rate and times the higher interest rate minus the lower discount rate. In this case, okay, we pick up 10% and 20%, you remember? That's the discount factor. So that means the lower will be 10, the higher will be 20, yeah? So 10% here and times 20 minus 10% there. But the question is, what will be the net present value at the lower rate? Okay, so the MPV at the lower rate. Okay. At discount factor at 10% is the lower rate. So the MPV at the lower rate is to be 49. At the MPV at the higher rate, which is 20%, it is 39. So 49. And 39. So if that's the case, then okay, first of all, we need to work out 20 minus 10%, so 
So that will give me 10% there. So that means 0 0.1. That's the same time. 49 minus 39. So that will give me 10. 49 divided by 10. So that will give me 4.9, right? So 10% plus 4.9 times 10%. Okay? So that means 0 0.1. Uh, 1, yes, plus 4.9 times 0 0.1. First of all, we need to work out 0 0.1 times 4.9, so that would give me 0 0.49 plus 0 0.1, so that would give me 0 0.59. Convert that into percentage, and that would give me 59%. And that means if we were to think about, okay, how we're going to finance our business, if the cost of capital is 59%. Okay, so that's the maximum that we can suffer because beyond which we'll end up with the loss making position. Okay, so that's how we apply the mechanism related to calculation. So now let's talk about the discursive part related to, M, uh, related to IRR. So is that good or bad? Well, first of all, Unlike in the MPV file calculation in absolute terms, for example, as a result from doing this project, I can get the net cash flow after discounting. That will be, let's say, um, I don't know, three hundred dollars. So three hundred dollars would be the cash flow into the business after doing this project from the MPV analysis perspective. Absolutely fine. But it's relatively hard for the non-financial managers to understand. It's simply because, let's say for NPV, we have to include the relevant cash flows. So what do I mean by relevant? Some costs, which means, okay, we've bought the plant 10 years ago, but we still use that into the upcoming uh, project. If we were to do this project in one year's time, we still use that plant that we bought 10 years ago we bought that plant 10 years ago, spending $1 billion, and should we include that $1 billion as the cost into the project that we're going to, that we're going to uh, start in one year's time? Well, perhaps the answer for that is no, because that $1 billion will simply be the sunk cost. It's not relevant. And that means using the IRR in particular, and I mean, using a percentage of relative terms, to measure the level of returns that we can get as we saw from this project, it will be easier for the non-financial managers to understand. So let's say from an early calculation, if I were to give you okay 59% for that NPV, uh, sorry, for the IRR, you know that after taking this project, uh, the overall returns that I can get is about 59% before considering the cost of financing a business. Absolutely fine. At the same time, it considers the time value of money concept, and that will be absolutely great. Which means the value of money now will not be the value of the money in the future. So those will be the advantages that we can talk about. But in order to calculate the IRR, we use the estimates to be perfectly honest with you. Because using this pro forma, such as what we've seen before, so the IRR equals to lower rate plus the net present value of the lower rate divided by net present value of the lower rate minus the higher rate times the higher rate minus the lower rate. We assume that every bits and pieces will be the linear relationship. But in the real life, that might not be the case. So, in order to calculate the IRR, as you can say, normally we can reflect this into a graph. The x-axis stands for the discount factor, such as the interest rates that we just talked about. The y-axis stands for the MPVs that we can get, so either will be positive or negative, and somewhere between this will be zero. So in order to calculate the IRR, all we can do is we pick up two discount factor, yeah? So from a previous, uh, previous study, 10% is was 20%. So let's say, okay, we pick up 10% there. And we pick up 20% there. 
So if that's the case then, the actual IRR should be like this. It's not a linear relationship, but when we apply the formulae, we use the linear relationship. So that means we'll simply link those two points together, which will give us the different IRR. So the actual IRR is on the left hand side, and the from the formulae calculation, we get the IRR. It's on the right hand side. So that means the IRR calculated from the formulae will be always greater than the actual IRR. So that's the reason why uh, in the real life we always adjust that. But in the exam you don't have to do that adjustment. Okay then, so if that's the case then, that will simply be the disadvantage of the IRR calculation. That's the first thing. But the question is, why do we pick up these two points here? So for example, why do we pick up the point as the IRR, because as you can see, the IRR is the maximum cost of capital for the business to finance this project, and that means the point at which here, the MPV will simply be zero. And that means, okay, if I were to have the IRR, so let's say, I don't know, 13%, and that means, if we were to finance our business and pay for the interest expense at 13%, we'll end up having nothing. We're not having a profit, nor suffering a loss. That's the first thing that you need to understand. Okay, so let me just to write off these bits and pieces. So from a calculations point of view, as you can see, you see here on, on your graph. So from a calculations point of view, let's say, we determine that IRR is approximately at 15% because it's the point at which the MP equals to zero. So that means if we were to finance the business on the left hand side, we'll end up having a positive MPV, as you can say, yeah, because the MPV is greater than zero. If we were to finance the business, uh, at a higher interest rate, more than 15%, as you can see on the right hand side, the MPV will simply be negative. Okay, so that's the logic. That's the reason why the 15% is the maximum cost of capital for the business, because we measure the return from this project before considering the cost of financing them. Okay, so that's the very, very important points that you need to notice here. Right, okay, so that would be our disadvantage of the IRR is related to calculation. We assume that everything will be, in, will be linear relationship, but in real life that might not be the case. It simply overstates the actual internal rate of return, so that's the first point. But second point is this, right, if I were to write them off, first of all. Okay, so as I said, in determining the internal rate of return, we pick up two discount rate. Okay, we pick up discount rate here. Okay, we pick up another discount rate here. Let's say, if I were to draw that line using my ruler, There's no overlap between this line and the x-axis, which will give us the IRR. So that means, if we just simply pick up two discount rates in one go, sometimes it will end up a situation where there will be no actual internal rate of return at all. And at the same time, okay, you pick up this two discount rate. But from the project, if you were to pick up, okay, we pick up this discount rate, here, and then this discount right there, and then this discount right there. So that means, okay, your draw line, which will give you the IRR in the first point, and the second IRR here. Uh, which one are you going to use? 
there will be multiple IRR if you were to use this method in some of the circumstances such as in the industries such as the mining industry because at the end of the project you have to give uh, you have to pay out the significant amount of cash flow um, because of the I mean environmental issues you have to decommission that mining site or oil jig and so on there'll be multiple internal rates of return but which one are going to choose them so those will be the disadvantages that you can learn so and thirdly it's not consistent with the MP when making a decision so that means okay if I were to have these two projects, so project number one and project number two, if I were to take the project one as well as the project two, so that would give me the net present value, let's say a hundred dollars and one million dollars. Certainly, if I were you, I would certainly go ahead with the project two because I can get one million dollars to cash into the business after they're doing this project, yeah. But if the IRR shows us, okay, so the project one, which gives us 50% of return, but only 1% of the project two. So from the IRR's point of view, you may choose the project one, but certainly this is not correct. Because in relation to relative terms, it depending upon the size of your investment. But in this case, certainly the project two will offer us a higher net present value, and hence, although it's inconsistent from the MPV as well as the IRR's point of view when calculating the return for this project, MPV is the king. So that's the reason why we choose the project too. So in a, in a lot of circumstances in particular, the internal rate of return ignores the size of the project, about the money they're going to spend in doing that project, but MPV can reflect the size of the project, in this case the project too, Surely the size of project two will be much larger than the project number one. The final disadvantage, as you can learn, is that when using the IRR, we assume the cash flows will be reinvested at the internal rate of return. So let me explain. So let's see the IRR example um, in your notes. So let's see then. We got the cash flow at the start of the year $100 out. 20 in in the first year, 120 in in the second year. So all we can do in calculating the IRR is going to discount those cash flows at two discount rate, right? yes? And then after we got the MP, the low rate as well as the higher rate, we then plot that into the formula. Okay, I've done the calculation for you. The IRR will give me, let's say, 19.7%. So that means okay. Let's see. First of all, we write this off at the year zero. So let's focus upon the year one. And that means I will have an assumption that if you were to get tons dollars from the year number one, you'll be, this cash flow of $20 would not be put into your, let's say, into your bed, into your company, no. That means you get $20 from the year number one, you then invest that $20 into the year number two, it's simply because that project will last for two years, and in the second year we need additional cash flows to buy the inventories and so on. And that's the reason why, okay, if I were to reinvest that $20 into year number two, we reinvest in one year, right? Because from year one up to year two, okay, we still got another year to go. So that means, okay, we times one plus the internal rate of return, 19.7% for next year. If you support that into a calculator, so let me see how much that we can get. So, times 20, that will give me 23.94. If you get $120 in the second year, because that's the end of the project life, and you don't have to reinvest that $120 into the subsequent years, and that means if you times one plus 
19.7%. For power of 0, that will give me 120. So that will give me 143.94. And that means if it calculates the IRS, that's kind of magic. Because you spend $100 out at the start of the year, if you were to convert the future cash flows 143.94 for two years at a particular discount, right? Equates to $100 as the cash out from the business, which means the MPV at equals to zero. So that point will be the internal rate of return. If you plot that into a calculator, the R will equals to 19.7%. And that means, as you can see, the internal rate of return calculation will simply assume that we got the cash flow in subsequent years, we re that at the internal rate of return. But the question is, you're too optimistic because not in every circumstances you will get the return from this project worth of 19.7%. Yes, when you're re your cash flows and that means it might be more prudent or careful for you to reinvest your cash flows at the cost of capital rather than the internal rate of return as the maximum cost of capital. And that means, as you can see, one of the disadvantages is we assume the cash flows will be reinvested at the internal rate of return, but that will be too optimistic as a result. So that's the internal rate of return. Hope you're absolutely happy with it. So remember, the internal rate of return is the overall return in percentage terms or relative measure from the project as a whole. And the IRR itself has lots of these disadvantages that we need to comment on in the Excel. So that finishes off our section for IRR. Accounting for your future